excited uh, this morning to be able to introduce a, a friend of mine who I met about a year ago this time. I don't know if Wesley even remembers, but we were at McDonough Christian Church for they got a bunch of uh, preachers together and they, they said that I counted, so I was able to go. And, uh, <laughs> and Wesley was there and they were talking about uh, some uh, the church plants in the area that they're trying to start. And Wesley uh, and Jamie Vernon, who is, uh, I was looking to see if Isaac and Alex were here. Jamie is Isaac's uncle, I think, if I'm saying it right, somebody help me out. Uh, who's here, uh, not uh, normally here, Isaac, in um, Wesley and Jamie planted a church uh, in College Park, East Point, Hayville area uh, that's called Tri-Cities Church. And I, I, I was excited to, to meet uh, Wesley that day, and I've since uh, talked with him several times. And, and what I've come to like so much about him is his, his passion for, for, for creating a culture and being a part of a culture that's all about uh, the grace of God. And so I'm excited about that from him. Wesley was a group in Atlanta. Uh, went to uh, Point University, Atlanta Christian College, and uh, went on to go to Columbia University and eventually went on to uh, Princeton University in, in New Jersey. He's, he's my Ivy League friend. He's my, the only person that I know that's, that's Ivy League. So, so uh, just if you would, give a, a warm SEC welcome to Weston Bowl. Hey. Well, good morning. I'm, I'm glad to be here and be able to share the scriptures with you all. Uh, yeah, like, I, like Jonathan said, we, we got a chance to meet, and uh, I loved hearing about his passion for the church and, and the gospel and about this community and, and uh, the ideas that he had, and um, I just have loved just sitting down and sharing time with him. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen too often. A lot of times I feel like um, that, that pastors are kind of in their own bubble, right? They, uh, they have their own church and their own concerns and don't break away and get that time together to be able to talk and communicate and bounce ideas off of one another and help each other where they're learning and growing. And so uh, I feel like we've been able to share and have that time and grow together. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm glad to be here to share the scriptures with you. Uh, just a little bit, I, I planned on talking a little bit about myself, but I guess I don't really need to. That was an introduction of Tri-Cities Church. We, um, yeah, we are a new church. We're just two years old. Um, God has done some incredible things uh, at, at our church, and, and we just we celebrate it every day. Um, of what God is doing in, in, in growing our church there. Uh, we, we, we began with a vision of, of being a, um, a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational, kind of multi-whatever, because that's kind of the way our world is turning, uh, church. And so we kind of began with that vision, at least that hope. Um, and and, um, and it, it required us to be very intentional um, and, and to trust God in some incredible ways. And we've been excited to see that happen, right? Because there was a lot of doubt about, if you're familiar with East Point right there where the airport is, there was a lot of doubt about whether or not we could do that. But we've seen that happen uh, in, our, in our church as people are reconciled one to another, as people uh, from diverse backgrounds and histories and stories are, are brought together. And particularly in these times, that has been extremely important as we see people standing together in unity um, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we celebrate that when it, when it happens. Um, well, uh, I typically at my church preach about an hour 15, but I... <laughs> just, just joking. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lock the doors. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, but I want to get into the scriptures because uh, um, uh, there's a lot here for us to see in this story. So let's, let's pray and then we'll get into the Bible. God, we give you thanks this morning that you uh, give us this opportunity and this space to read the scriptures openly, free, freely, without fear of persecution, without fear of harm, God, that you've given us this ability to open the Bibles and have them in our hands and to read your scripture and to memorize it and to know your word. God, that's an incredible thing. And so, God, as we get to know your word, as we become more familiar with it, God, please help us not just to know your word, but to know your way and to walk in it, to live it out. And so, God, today as we open the scriptures, help us to understand the way that you're calling us to walk and how you're calling us to live out our lives, not just today, but tomorrow and the day after and the day after for the glory of God, and for the good of this world. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, it's human nature for us to have an, uh, an idea about, about how we want our lives to turn out, right? Everybody has this kind of, this uh, almost like a preconceived idea about how they want their life to turn out. And this begins with phrases like, I want, right? I want 
this, right? Maybe I want to go to a certain college, or I want to drive a certain car, or I want to have a certain size house, or I want to have a certain job, or I want to retire in a certain place. I, I want, I wish, I hope. We all have these kind of preconceived ideas, right? If you sit down and think about it for a moment, about how we want our lives to turn out. I want, I wish, I hope. And one of the things that I've learned about um, at least the way God works, and this is if you're living your life following God, and I, and I, believe that you can, um, I, I believe that you can persevere against God in frustration, right? You can live your whole life persevering against God in frustration, but if you listen for the way that God is working things out in your life and the way God is leading you in your life, God's ideas, you'll learn this, right? God's ideas don't always line up with our ideas, right? That's just the way, at least that's been the way. Maybe you have more godly ideas than I do, but at least the way it's worked out in my life is I found that God's ideas very rarely line up with mine. Well, I remember when I was, when I was getting ready to graduate uh, high school, all throughout high school, I had this thing for cars. I worked with my hands. I would take things apart, put them back together. Things that didn't work, I'd take them apart, figure out how they worked, and put them together and make them work. God had given me a particular gift for working with my hands. I worked on cars, and that was kind of what I did day in and day out. And I remember going to college, and it was, it was clear. What is, what is God calling you to do? Well, of course, he wants me um, uh, to be a mechanic. My mom said you had to go, I had to go to college, so I said, I'm going to be a mechanical engineer, right? And I'm going to work with my hands. Those are the gifts that God has given me. Um, and it became very clear, though, to me, that is, I, I went to Southern Polytech my first year in college. It became very clear to me that that wasn't God's idea for my life, right? That was my idea that I had for my life. And then the second year, I transferred to Atlanta Christian College, now Point University. I remember getting there. And I, I've always wanted to go back and ask my professors if they thought I was crazy. Um, because I, I remember my first year there, they, people would say, well, hey, I was a biblical studies major. So, so what are you going to do when you, when you graduate? Like when you get this biblical studies degree, what are you going to do with it? And I used to tell them I was going to be a mechanic on the mission field, right? Because these... <laughs> No lie, right? Because I, I, I heard somewhere that mechanics drove, you know, they, I mean, uh, missionaries had these cars and they would break down and they couldn't find a mechanic. And there were some special missionaries that had mechanics that traveled with them. And whenever their stuff broke down, these, these guys were there to fix it. So, of course, I was a handy man. I was going to I was going to do that, but that wasn't God's idea for my life. That was my idea. I was trying to figure this thing out, and, and my idea, again, did not line up with God's idea. When I graduated from Point University, I remember they had this banquet, and we were there in the cafeteria, this really nice banquet. All the professors and students were there, and we were talking, of course, as graduates. That the question was, what are you going to do now that you graduate? And I said it, and I should not have said it, because this is the way it always seems to go. God's idea doesn't line up with my idea. I, I said, anything but youth ministry. That was in April or May. In June of that year, I became a youth minister. <laughs> When I finished seminary here again, I said, I am done with, with academia. I'm not going back to school. I've, done, I've been in school way too long. I just wanted to be a mechanic. I never thought I'd be in school this long. Two years later, where was I? In Princeton, right? God has a sense of, of humor, and his ideas don't always line up with our ideas, right? But he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. God's ideas don't always line up with our ideas. In the scriptures, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus meets this guy. and uh, um, The Bible says he was a, a lawyer or an expert in the law. And Jesus meets him. Uh, and this guy came to Jesus with these preconceived ideas about how the world should work out. And, and Jesus kind of pushes back against that. I just, I just really want to read this story in Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to begin in verse 25. I want to read this, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. So in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says, And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him, him being Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Simple question, right? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, he being Jesus, said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, he being the lawyer, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. 
That's a good Sunday school answer, right? There's nothing wrong there. That is, that is a good answer. If you were in Sunday school and somebody asked you that question, that's, that's a great answer. And Jesus said that very same thing, right? You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, that's where the scripture begins to take kind of a bad turn for this guy, desiring to prove that he was right, right? That's what justify means. He wanted to prove that he was right. So here he is, and this is always a dangerous thing. I've learned this in life. You'll learn this in life, right? If you encounter Jesus with the idea that I am right, <laughs> right? If, you, if you come to Jesus with the idea, and we do this, right? If we come to Jesus with the idea that we are right, um, before we encounter him, right? I have this idea that I am right. That is always a bad road to go down. And so here comes this guy. He has this idea that I know I'm a lawyer. I got this thing all figured out. And so he wanted to justify himself, the Bible says. And so desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied. And this is where he begins to tell this story. A man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest, and this is the part of the story where you're like, that's a lucky guy, right? By chance, a priest was coming down on, the, uh, on the, down that same road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A priest. And he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now the words that are like flashing at me from the Bible are he saw him, right? We, we, he, the Bible leaves no excuse for this man, right? It says he saw him, the, both the priests, he saw him, like flashing lights. The Levite, he saw him and then made a conscious decision to pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, here again, he's seeing him, he had compassion, and he went to him and bound up his wounds, poured oil and wine on them. Then he set him on his animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whenever you spend it, right, I will repay you, and I will come back. Which of these, Jesus asked, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And he, the lawyer, couldn't help but respond, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. The thing I love about that scripture is it says this guy was testing Jesus, right? He came with this ideal of testing him. And every time he asked Jesus a question, it's kind of weird the way Jesus does it, but he, he turns the question back on him, right? And so he says, no, I, that's what's written in the law. How do you read it, right? Um, and, and so he's always turning the question back on him and, and testing him. And I imagine this guy getting frustrated. But the thing that jumps out to me in the scripture is that it's right at the very beginning, it's this word expert, right? The Bible says that he was an expert or a lawyer um, um, in, in the law. Like he, he knew the law. He was an expert. Uh, he, he was a lawyer. He had studied the Old Testament history. He knew all the this books from Genesis all the way to the beginning where the New Testament, the Old Testament ends, right? He knew the books of the Bible. He knew all the laws. He knew how God had worked among his people. He knew this whole long history of God's interactions with human beings, Right? He knew all about that. He had studied the, the law, and not, not just the Ten Commandments, but there were 633 maybe uh, laws in the Old Testament. And this guy knew those like the back of his hand. And so he came to God, to Jesus, with these preconceived ideas that were founded in history, that were founded in what he knew about God, he knew how God had worked, and so he thought he had it fairly well figured out how God would work in the future. And he had these preconceived ideas. 
Now, in this parable, Jesus begins challenging the preconceived ideas that the Jews had. You see, the Jews believed that they were God's favorites, right? In in the Old Testament, if you read in the Bible, beginning in uh, Genesis chapter 12, God chooses this man named Abraham and chooses to work through him, and he says some powerful things into his life, right? He says, I will bless you, right? And I will bless those who bless you and those who curse you, I will curse. God promises through Abraham that he's going to build up a people who are going to have God's favor, right? He's going to build up a people that he is going to protect, that he's going to protect these people for himself. For himself. And what the, what the, the, um, what the Jews missed in that um, it is not that they were God's favorites, right? They believed wholeheartedly that God loves us more than they loved every, than he loves everyone else. That we are God's favorite, we are God's chosen, God is fully for us and not for them. And it created this incredible divide in that world where it was uh, Jews and everyone else, right? Uh, Jews, God's favor, favorite, and, and then there were heathens and pagans and Gentiles and whatever name they wanted to call them, right? And it created this incredible divide where they felt like they were God's favorite. Now, if you read just the Old Testament, like if you're reading the scriptures and you see the stories that kind of hit you like a ton of bricks, God was fighting for them, right? God says, I will deliver you. I will be your God. You be my people. I will be your God. God says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Um, I will protect you. I will continue my work through your lineage, right? For generations upon generations, I will be with you and I will be your God. God. God is promising them things over and over and over and over again. God is promising the Israelites thing after thing after thing, and they're good things. He's keeping his promise that he made to Abraham. I will bless you. I will bless your descendants. I will take care of you. And when we read the Old Testament, that becomes very clear. And never do we read anything about God doing anything in the lives of of anyone else, any other nationality, any other tribe, any other ethnicity, any other race. God is all about some Jews, and he's building these people for himself. And I think when we read that, I, I think we got to understand how they felt. It's an easy mistake for us to make. Right? It would be easy for them if God is constantly blessing you and blessing you and blessing you as opposed to other people. It would be easy for us to say, yeah, I'm, I'm God's favorite, right? It would be easy to walk with my head high and my chest poked out and excited because I'm, yeah, I'm God's favor. The God of creation is on my side. Yeah, I'm a Jew. I'm, a, I'm proud because God loves us. And all this began to form the lens through which they saw the world, right? They saw the world as a world where God loved them as opposed to anyone else. And this affected the way they lived in the world. You see, they lived toward their enemies as God's favor. I'm God's chosen. God is on my side. Whoever is against me, my God is bigger than them. And that's true. But here's the thing. What they missed and what Jesus reveals in the New Testament is that God's heart is for all people, right? That God is doing something that was much bigger than the Jews, that God was doing something that couldn't be contained among the Israelites, that God was doing something uh, for all people, for the whole world. And we see this over and over again in the Scriptures. If you ever read some of these biblical stories, there's this theme, almost a motif that's running throughout the Scriptures, and that's God's choosing one for the many. He's choosing one for the many. He chose Abraham and said, your descendants will be as numerous as the sands on the shore, right? Because God was doing something that was so much bigger than Abraham. God wasn't blessing him just so that he could live a blessed life, but so that he could be a blessing. God built this community, this nation, the Israelites, and he he wasn't just building them and showing them favor just so he could bless this nation, but so that he could be a blessing to the whole entire world world. And it comes clear in, in John three sixteen where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, right, but have everlasting life. What God was doing wasn't excluded to the Jews, but it was for the entire world. 
And so here we have this guy that came to Jesus with these preconceived ideas, right? Um, this idea that they are God's favorite, they are God's chosen, that God is for them as opposed to anyone else. And Jesus kind of hits them with this story. The thing I love about the parables, some of them at least, is at least I imagine it happening this way, is they almost have a delayed effect, right? Um, it's almost like Jesus tells this story. He's always telling these stories. The stories, um, the, the full picture doesn't ever come in uh, as clearly at the beginning of a story as when you go home and you begin to think about it. And, and so Jesus would tell these stories to people. And I just imagine this guy coming home uh, and sitting around the kitchen table and, and telling this story to his wife. Hey, Jesus told this, this story today. And um, I, I don't quite understand. I don't really get what he's saying. And then he's retelling it to his wife. And it's almost like a light bulb comes on in his head. It's like, how could he, like, how could he say that? Like, I, w- w- I, the audacity of Jesus, right, uh, to say something like that to, to, to us, to me, to God's chosen. But, but this parable is a little bit different than some of the other parables where Jesus did that. This was almost like a direct jab, right? He, he's not hiding the, the point here. Um, it, it's very clear. If you look back in the story where it talks about a man's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, right? That, that was a long, dangerous road. There were a lot of times um, a robbers and thieves that were hiding in the bushes. The road was rough. It was downhill. It was a steep decline. It was a hard road to walk. And so he's walking down this road. And, and, and you would expect in this story that the priest would be the hero of the story, right? And so you, you would think that Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, would do that, that he would have sense enough to make the priest the hero of the story. Um, but, but he doesn't go that direction. Um, and so people are probably a little shocked. There's probably some <sighs> going on when he makes the priest walk past him, right? Um, and then the Levi, you expect him to be the hero of the story. But the priest, the Levi walks past them as well. But then the Samaritan, right? Um, nobody would have thought the Samaritan would have stopped. Because in this day, in biblical times, Jews and Samaritans didn't get along very well. Let's just put it that way. They, they just didn't like each other. Um, Jews considered themselves to be God's favorite. Right? They, they were pure, at least in their minds. They were pure and, and holy, and um, they were, they were um, um, innocent in, in God's eyes. And Samaritans were a mixed race. Um, they had not kept themselves pure. They had married outside of their race and, and, uh, and had um, done some things to the Jews, and the Jews had done some things to them. I even uh, read this story about the Samaritans running in the temple with a um, uh, bags of bones and just kind of dumping them out just to make the Jews uh, mad. And so um, the Jews and Samaritans didn't get along with one another. Um, they had done some mean things to each other, and they, they were enemies. They, they kept themselves separate. And so here comes Jesus, this Jewish rabbi, this Jewish teacher, and the Samaritan of all people becomes the hero of the story. Now, when I read the, the, the scriptures, um, biblical times, in biblical times, they were not nearly as civil as we are today. <laughs> right? People today will talk about you behind your back, but rarely uh, will they say something to your face. And now, in biblical times, Jesus is lucky that he didn't get drug out of the room and stoned right there on the spot because that's the kind of stuff they did. Right? You offend somebody in biblical times, you offend a community of people in biblical times, and they will handle it, right? They will handle it in their own way. They will put you away, not quietly, right? They will make a scene out of it. And so you almost expect that from this story, Jesus being so bold as to make the Samaritan the hero of the story. And Jesus says, no, this Samaritan is the one that did the right thing. And he turns the question back on this lawyer and says, who is the neighbor? Who was his neighbor? And this lawyer had to go home and he had to sit with this question. I imagine him sitting around the kitchen table with his wife and kids and retelling this story and sitting with it and beginning to ask, what, what do we do with this? He had to decide what he was going to do with this story. Now, I, I believe wholeheartedly that our kids, our spouses, our families, 
need to see us wrestling with what we're going to do with the Scriptures, how we're going to live out our lives in light of them. And here this guy, hopefully he went home and began to do that, began to sit down and say, hey, this is what Jesus said. What are we, what are we going to do with that? I think even more importantly today is we as a church have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with this Scripture? Right? What are we going to do with what's written here? Because what's happening here is Jesus is revealing his love for all people, every race, every nation, every tribe, every ethnicity, every culture, every socioeconomic group. Jesus is revealing his incredible love for all people, not just the Jews, but for Samaritans, their enemies, and for the entire world. And as a church, we have to, we have to step back and we got to begin thinking, what does that mean for us? You see, often this parable is used to start ministries, uh, ministries that are focused on compassion, where, where people will care for the poor, or care for the sick, or care for the, the needy. But what Jesus is doing is a transition in their society, uh, uh, culturally, racially, ethnically, culturally, where, where he's saying the Samaritan, the one who was previously your enemy, is now your neighbor and you treat them like you previously treated those you thought were your neighbors. You see, in biblical times, it was quite all right to have certain people that you, that you, um, that you, you, were, you were open about, right? This person does not belong. They, they are a sinner. They, the uh, tax collectors. You could mistreat a tax collector, and nobody, uh, even a person that believed in God and loving other people, would, would blame you for mistreating a tax collector, right? Um, uh, biblical times, prostitutes, right? They were marginalized, cast to the outside of society. Nobody would, would be upset with you. There was that, that one story, adulterers, right? The, the one story where they drug this adulterer out to the, um, to the edge of the city and began or were at least preparing to stone her. Wasn't nobody crying foul, right? Nobody was saying there was anything wrong there. Wasn't anything wrong in that situation. It was perfectly normal for you to mistreat people who you believed were sinners that belonged on the outskirts, were marginalized. And so Samaritans would have fallen in that category. Um, what Jesus is saying to them is, those are the ones that you have to draw near. And that would have made them very uncomfortable. I'm not sure uncomfortable would even describes what they would have felt in that moment. And Jesus is calling them to draw them near. You know, we in the church today, uh, we live in changing times. I, I, you know, one thing that I, that I heard someone say once, um, Jesus says, go to every nation, tribe, um, ethnicity with the gospel, right? Uh, make disciples, right, of every nation and tribe. Um, and, and we could do that now in our backyards. It, it's interesting the way our society is diversifying rapidly. Neighborhoods are changing. Our communities are becoming more diverse. It's becoming extremely convenient to share the gospel with those who are not like us, right? Those who don't look like us, those who don't come from the same background. We just go to Starbucks, and there it is, right? McDonald's, and there it is. Golden Corral, and there it is, right? Diversity is all around us. Our world is changing rapidly, and we have opportunities to share the gospel to draw those who are at one point far near to us. And I think when we read this scripture, that that's one of the things that Jesus is getting at for us today. We can't ignore that application that he's saying, hey, the Samaritan, draw him near. That's your neighbor. We can't ignore the fact that there are people in our neighborhood who weren't there before, and he's calling us to draw them near. And that's our neighbor. And wrestle with what it looks like for us to love those who previously were overlooked. And we got to go home and we got to sit with that. And we got to wrestle with it. And we got to decide what we're going to do with it. Because if we're the church and we're faithful to the scriptures, Jesus is beginning to teach. And we see this right here in this story and onward into where Paul's teaching uh, where Jesus is beginning to teach 
that God's love extends beyond all boundaries that our society and culture raise us up. Whether those are racial boundaries, whether those are ethnic boundaries, whether those are socioeconomic boundaries, whether those are fashion boundaries. I just don't like the way she dresses. I don't want her in my church, right? Uh, I have heard stuff like that said, right? Um, I don't want her in my church the way she's dressing, right? Uh, Fashion boundaries. God's love extends beyond all boundaries that our society erects, right? And it draws those who we would previously push to the margins close to us. And if we're going to wrestle with the scriptures, and if we're going to be a church that's faithful to the scriptures, we got to wrestle with what that looks like right here in Snellville. I tell you, we're wrestling with it down in East Point where our church is. Um, and, and every day we're finding that we have to be a lot more intentional about the way we do ministry. You see, this scripture is challenging us to ask ourselves the question, are we ministering to our neighbor? Are we loving our neighbor? And do they know it? Now, the powerful thing that happens in this this scripture is this Samaritan, right? He's coming down the road, and and he gets off of his, it says animal, it's probably a donkey that he was riding down the road, right? And so he gets off his donkey. He doesn't know, um, he doesn't have a clue how this situation is going to play itself out. There's no way that he could have known how it was going to play itself out. First of all, he didn't belong on that road. Right, because typically that road was reserved for Jews. It was coming down from Jerusalem, where the temple was, um, down to Jericho. There were usually only Jews traveling that road. So one, he was in a neighborhood that he did not belong in. Two, he did not know whether the robbers who robbed this man, stripped him, and left him for dead were still waiting in the bushes. Uh, three, it was a dangerous road. You wanted to get to where you were going, and you wanted to get there quickly. Uh, four, there's probably, you could probably um, uh, uh, conclude that he was going somewhere, needed to get there fast. This road was a little bit quicker, and so he was trying to get to where he was going. Uh, and he knew that getting off of his donkey might delay him, might get him into some trouble, might get him late for wherever he's going. Uh, either way, he knew that it wasn't going to work out well for him. Uh, and he gets off, and he begins to tend for this guy's needs. Now, the thing that makes him different than everyone else in the story, the thing that makes him different from the priest, the thing that makes him different from the Levi, uh, the thing that makes him different from everyone else in this story is that the Bible says he had compassion. He had compassion. You see, compassion is a relentless concern for those who are overlooked. This guy had compassion. It's a relentless concern that won't let you keep going. This guy had compassion. It's a relentless concern that makes you stop and consider. This guy had compassion. It's a relentless concern that's not so much concerned about what's going to happen to me if I stop and do something, or what's going to happen to me if I change the way I do something, but it's more concerned about what's going to happen here in this community, in my community, on this road, if I don't do something. You see, he reversed the question from what's going to happen to me if I do something to what's going to happen to this man if I don't stop and do something. And I think that's the very question that the church today has to be wrestling with. And when I say church, I'm not just talking about church as in uh, Jonathan and the elders, right? I'm talking about church as in everyone who calls himself a follower of Jesus Christ. That's the church. We are the church. And the church today has to wrestle with this question, who am I currently overlooking? Who is my neighbor? Who am I currently overlooking? And what can I do to show them powerfully the love of Jesus Christ? This man got off of his donkey, off of his animal, and he began to care for this man like nobody would have expected. He put his own life in danger. He risked loss so that he could care for this man. 
so that he could live faithfully to the Scriptures. And I believe we as a people who read this in the setting of a church, we got to ask that question. But the Samaritan, as he journeyed where he came, as he journeyed, came to where he was, where the man was laying there, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, poured oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care for him, took care of him. I imagine him lovingly, gently caring for this man's needs. And I imagine when he woke up and heard that a Samaritan did that, his life was forever changed. You see, compassion crosses the divide. And when the divide is crossed and those on the other side experience the love of Jesus Christ, their lives are forever changed. The most powerful thing we can do as the church today is to allow compassion to draw us across the divide, to love our neighbor, so that our world, our community, will never be the same. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks this morning that you've called us into this place and you've given us opportunities to read the scriptures. And God, we all come to the Bible with preconceived ideas about uh, who you are, what you've done, what you're doing, what you're going to do in our world. Um, and God, I just pray today that you will shake those ideas up. God, that you'll shake up our preconceived ideas and you'll help us not just to see what you've done in our world in times past, but what you're doing in our world today what you want to do in our community today. God, I pray that you'll help us to see what you want to do in Snellville today through Snellville Christian Church. God, I must believe that you place this church here for a reason, God, and that that season that you've placed them here isn't up, it's not over, God, but you have a plan for them. and It includes reaching this, this city um, and, and growing into a powerful, powerful church that influences the gospel and where people are seen coming together in unity and being the church like we saw in the first century. God, please let that be so. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen.